Hi folks, welcome to part three of our intro to chemistry. In this video, we're gonna work on understanding how the periodic table is organized and also how to use the information present in the cells of the periodic table. There's a cell right there. Um, to figure out the number of subatomic particles in an atom of that element. Um, and then that will allow us to draw a Bohr model. Okay, so quick review. Protons, neutrons, electrons come together to form all of the elements that exist. Each element has a unique name and a unique symbol. And please remember, for your sake as well as mine, that although the symbols are made of letters, they're still symbols. And when you change the case of a letter, if it's part of a symbol, you've changed the symbol. You'll see what I mean. The periodic table of elements is a complete list of all of the elements that exist naturally as well as the ones that we crazy human beings have created um, in super colliders. So the periodic table is a data table, right? Just like an Excel spreadsheet, right, where you've got rows and columns you have a label at the top of the column of each column. You have labels for each row. So it's a strange data table, um, but there actually is an order to it. And um, we'll come back to that. Um, one of the things that I always point out to students because it mystified me for so long, and maybe it uh, will be obvious to you all, but um, I had no idea what these elements were doing for the longest time. Like, what the heck are they doing down there? Um, one of the reasons that I love this particular periodic table is because it has this little, these little asterisks down here that show you that, oh, elements 57 through 70 slot right up in here. And elements 89 through 102, which are shown down here, belong in here. So the periodic table actually looks like this when we don't need to fit it into a limited amount of space. Um, but it would I don't know what size printer you need for that, so we're going to use a more typical one. Okay, so now let's look at the individual cells of the periodic table, right? So just like in any kind of data table, think about an Excel spreadsheet, the place where you're going to type in the numbers if you're trying to figure out, you know, how much did I spend on books versus tuition versus um, uh, groceries or electricity, right? Each of those is going to have their own column. And then maybe your rows are the different months if you're tracking a budget. Um, each number that you type in to a particular box is what is included in a single cell of your data table. Similarly, there are some, there are some information that is represented inside the cell of cells in a periodic table. So you'll usually find two numbers, um, and you will find the symbol. Again, symbol that represents the element. So first thing I want to say about the numbers is that whether the number is above the symbol or below it, does not matter, right? The smaller number, regardless of whether it's on the top or on the bottom, is referred to as the atomic number.
and the larger number is the atomic mass. Now, that may seem like, well, people should just do it the same way, regardless. Um, but the thing is, right, once you learn the basic chemistry, um, it will seem obvious, right? Remember, which two particles have mass? Protons and neutrons. So once you know that the number, that the atomic number tells you the number of protons, for that particular element, you'll realize that the atomic mass has got to always be the larger number because every element except for hydrogen has <clears throat> neutrons associated with it, right? And neutrons also have mass. Okay, so... The atomic number is the number of protons, and it is the number of protons that determines what element you're looking at. The atomic number, the number of protons, never changes in a chemical reaction. Another way of saying that is that you can't convert one element into a different element using chemistry, right? To do that, you need a nuclear reaction, not a chemical reaction. Second big idea with this slide is that, is that, well, is the term electrically neutral. So electrically neutral means uncharged and if an atom is uncharged, it is so because the number of protons is pre precisely equaled by the number of electrons. Again, protons are positive, electrons are negative. The size of the charge is the same, but opposite sign for those two subatomic particles. So if I know the number of protons, and I'm pulling my information from the periodic table, or the question I'm reading says that I've got an uncharged or an electrically neutral atom, you know that the number of electrons is the same as the number of protons. All right, so atomic mass. Now, the atomic mass number, which is a little bit of a weird combination of words, is equal to the number of protons and neutrons. And if you're talking about a single atom of an element, it has to be a whole number. The mass number has to be a whole number. And that's because using, um, using chemistry, you can't change the number of protons, and it turns out you also can't change the number of neutrons. So, remember that electrons have, for our purposes, no mass, so we're not going to count those, right? So, if I have um, five protons and six neutrons, and sorry, my drawing it pencil in this app. I can't change the size of the pencil. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so I've got five protons, six neutrons, and five electrons. So five protons plus six neutrons gives me 11 protons and neutrons. Because each proton has a mass of 1 AMU, if I have 5 protons, I have 5 AMU. If I have 6 neutrons, I have 6 AMU. And so I have 11 AMU. We're not going to count the mass of the electrons because it's never going to be 
that mass is never going to be great enough to give us an additional AMU. So the reason it's called atomic mass number is because way back in the day, those folks that decided they didn't want to do math with that crazy, those crazy tiny numbers made the number of protons equal to the mass of protons and the number of neutrons equal to the mass of neutrons. Now, if you have a periodic table out and you're looking at it, you might think, well, wait a second, you're saying it's always a whole number. It's for any single atom, right? But it turns out there are these, it, it's possible to have the same element, but have a different number of neutrons. So if it's the same element, means it's the same type. If it has a different mass and it's the same element, the only way for that to be the case is if you have a different number of neutrons. Those, <clears throat> those different forms of the same element are called isotopes. More about that in a second. The average atomic mass can be a decimal because it is an average of all of the different isotope masses. Now, if you're trying to figure out the number of subatomic particles, you're always going to round to the nearest whole number if you're using the periodic table or if you're told You've got an atom that's got seven protons and 15 neutrons. I'm just making this up. Um, what's the mass, right? It's seven plus 15. All right. So isotopes. The prefix iso means same. And tope means type. Same type, same element. If it's the same element, as the same number of protons. Different isotopes differ in mass. Well, if you can't, there are two particles with mass, protons and neutrons. If you have the same number of protons and a difference in mass, it's going to have to be because you have a different number of neutrons. Most isotopes are stable, um, and all isotopes, and this is a really important point, um, they participate in chemical reactions in exactly the same way. So radioactive carbon is going to form chemical bonds with the same kind of the same elements in the same proportions as non-radioactive carbon, right? When we say an isotope is not stable, um, what we mean is that every so often, and it's different for um, each element and each isotope, every so often, a, nuclear particle, because the nucleus is unstable, a proton or a neutron will get shot out. That's what, that's one form of radiation, right? So those isotopes are called radioisotopes. Radio for radioactive, iso for same, tope for type. So in the bottom of this slide, we have um, three isotopes of carbon. So carbon is represented by a capital C in the periodic table. And the most common form of carbon has a mass of 12. So in isotope notation, you have on the left side of the symbol, a subscript with the mass, and then you have the symbol. Sometimes you'll see 
the atomic number, but often you won't. Often this is the, the way it will be, be, be written because in this context, a capital C is the symbol that means six protons. Here, there, everywhere, every place in the universe. So carbon-12 has six protons, which means it has six neutrons. Carbon-13, still carbon, which means six protons, but now to make up that additional mass, I have to have an extra neutron. Carbon-14, which is the radioactive form of carbon, has a mass of 14, still six protons, but it has eight neutrons. Okay, so let's use this information to figure out the number of subatomic particles. Remember, the smaller number in the cell, regardless of where it's located, is the number of protons. If you know that the atom is electrically neutral, which it is always if you're using the periodic table, then you know the number of electrons, because electrically neutral means protons equal electrons. The mass of the atom is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So I know the mass, I know the number of protons, I know electrons don't have mass, so I can take the mass, which really is protons plus neutrons, subtract the protons, and all I have left are neutrons. Similarly, if I know the mass and I'm given the number of neutrons, I can subtract and get the number of protons. And when I have the number of protons, I can go to my periodic table and figure out what element I'm talking about. All right. So let's work through this. S stands for sulfur. Um, and by the way, you guys will, do not need to memorize um, any, uh, anything about the periodic table other than what the rows and columns mean and how to use um, the information in the cell. So you don't have to know that carbon has six protons um, and a mass, average mass of 12.01 AMU because um, that's what it's, that's why there are periodic tables on the wall, chemistry labs. So sulfur, you've got, it's got the smaller number is 16, so that tells me I have 16 protons. And I'm going to have 16 electrons because they're negatively charged, and this is from the periodic table, so it's neutral. I'm going to take that 32.07 and round right to the nearest whole number, which is 32. So 32 minus 16, which is the number of protons, gives me 16. All right, so let's look at phosphorus. Phosphorus has an atomic number of 15, so that means 15 protons and 15 electrons. It has a mass that rounds to 31. So I'm going to take that mass, 31, subtract the number of protons, and I get 16 neutrons. Oxygen, so eight protons, which means eight electrons. Mass is 16, so I don't have to do any rounding here. 16 minus eight is eight. All right, nitrogen. 
nitrogen. 14 is the mass. 7 is the atomic number, so that tells me protons. The number of protons in an uncharged atom is equal to the number of electrons. I've got a mass that rounds to 14. 14 minus 7 is 7. Carbon is an atomic number of 6. 6 protons, which means 6 electrons. The mass would round to 12. 12 minus 6 gives me 6. Hydrogen. So it's got an atomic number of 1. 1 proton, 1 electron. The atomic mass rounds to 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. So hydrogen is the only element that doesn't normally have a neutron with it. There are isotopes of hydrogen that, that do have neutrons, but um, the most common form of hydrogen is a single proton orbited by a single electron. We don't have any need for neutrons to keep the protons just far enough apart that the atom is stable because we only have one proton. All right, so you definitely need to be able to do this for your quiz, for the exam, post-lab, you name it. All right, now we're going to practice using that information from the periodic table to figure out how to draw Bohr diagrams. So do yourself a favor. If you're not used to doing this, follow this process. First thing you want to do is use the periodic table to figure out the number of the three subatomic particles. Then put the number of protons and the number of neutrons in the nucleus, and then draw electron shells, right? The innermost shell, remember, can only hold two electrons. The next shell out can hold up to eight, but no more. Electrostatic repulsion, remember? The third shell can hold up to eight. So I've been drawing hydrogen, so there's hydrogen again, right? If I look at the periodic table for carbon, right, I would see six and 12. So that tells me I've got six protons. 12 minus 6 gives me 6 neutrons. Get rid of this. And then my electrons I'm going to put in here. So there's 1, 2 for the first. Can't fit any more in. So now I'm going to start using, for my valence electrons, I'm going to start using the... Um, clock method. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So if I remember the octet rule that most atoms don't have full shells and the, they're most stable with a full valence shell, which is eight electrons in that valence shell. So when I draw carbon like this, it makes it really easy to see, oh, well, it needs eight, it has four. It really needs four more to be stable. Get rid of this so I can put nitrogen in here. All right, so nitrogen. I think it's 14. So seven atomic number means seven protons. That means seven electrons. And 14, which is my mass, which is neutrons plus protons. So mass minus the atomic number gives me seven neutrons. And in case you were wondering, it is not always the case that you just double the number of protons to get neutrons. It just so happens that in the most common elements you find in living things, um, which you can remember 
with the mnemonic sponge, um, which the, the symbols from the, um, the periodic table of the six most common elements in living or the molecules of living things. Sulfur, phosphorus, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen. Um, it just so happens that um, in a lot of those cases you have doubling. Okay, so now I'm going to do my drawing. So I've got seven protons, seven neutrons, and then I'm going to put my electrons one, two, right, and I still, I've got two accounted for, I still have five to go. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One of the things that's so powerful about this way of drawing atoms is that, um, let's say I had my friend hydrogen over here, right? Um, I can tell that if I have hydrogen and nitrogen in the same place with plenty of energy, um, that they will form a molecule where I have one nitrogen atom and three hydrogen atoms. More about that when we talk about bonding. Okay, so sulfur. If I look at the periodic table, I see that sulfur has an atomic number of 16, which means 16 protons, that means 16 electrons, has a mass that rounds to 32, I think, <laughs> so that gives me 16 neutrons. So then I can make my nucleus and then start to put my, oops, start to put my electrons in. So 16 electrons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, I still have more to go. Not 11, 10, sorry, I miscounted. So I can't fit any more in. I have to pop out and draw another energy shell. These energy shells or energy levels, by the way, only exist when there are electrons in them. So if the electron is removed in some way, it's not like there's a, a wire or something that the electrons are um, were attached to. Okay, so I need six more electrons. So one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, so again, right, this makes it easy to tell. I need two more electrons for sulfur to be stable. All right, I'm gonna have you guys practice by drawing the Bohr diagram for phosphorus and for oxygen. Next video, we will start talking about how you build molecules. Remember a molecule is two or more atoms held together with a bit of energy in the form of a chemical bond, and that happens during chemical reactions.